Have you ever listened to the man of words? I'm going to bring him forward here. I've known David for several years. I was drafted for this early this morning. <laughs> no, no preparation. We were here two months ago. Sherry and I, we came through the court. We had met Bob June of 2002. We flew out to Tucson. Jack Carr still remembers the meeting. He says, the first time I've ever been in a restaurant for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> we had some conversation about Mr. Miller. James had worked with David. Who's in here is familiar with David Miller? Jerry and I got our, started doing a lot of research on words, and particularly from a scriptural standpoint, probably seven years ago. A lot of that was based on a book that I read called Come Out of Her, My People by C.J. Coster. The book is published by the Institute for Scripture Research out of South Africa. There are people here in the U.S. who carry the book. The book goes into detail on a lot of adoptions that have been put into Scripture of names of other gods and other religions. From that, the Father kind of took us into a path where he decided to take that and put us into a legal realm with some problems. How everybody got here probably was through some sort of problem. As Dan likes to say, until somebody's ox is gored, they're not real interested. <laughs> I had a friend of mine, he's probably one of the only lawyers I know in the country who is a lawyer and not an attorney. He um, made a recommendation. I take a look at David Wynn Miller's material, and we fell right into it. I can't say that it's practical to use today or that I would go back and use it again. There are some people that are still using it, but the numbers have seriously dwindled over the past two years. Based on something that was talked about here this morning, and I'll talk about that briefly, and it had to do with dissension among the people. Well, it had to do with two things. It had to do with honest leadership, and I mean honest leadership, and also egos, other people wanting credit. Everybody wanted credit for something. I don't, I don't say everybody, but a lot of people did, because if they came up with a new idea or a new procedure or something that we were using, oh, if they didn't get the credit, it was just terrible. I may talk about a little bit of that procedure for some of you guys who know it. Like I said, it's beyond what they're using, and in addition to that, I think you might agree with this, Bob. I think part of their downfall has been that they've tried to come in and tell the corporation how to run their corporation. Yeah, I'd say that's about it. Well, does that corporation belong to them? You're not going to tell the corporation how to run their business, and that's not what this is about, any of this. To be a sovereign and take responsibility means you're going to become a diplomat. You're going to act some responsibility in the world. This is not a war. And if you think it is, as my buddy back there says, okay, you want to go to war? Here's what you do first. You go outside and you take your 45 and you point it down at your foot and you go ahead and shoot a hole in it right there. And then once you get feeling real comfortable with that, then you're going to know what it's like to go to war. Now, it's a war in a sense, but at I hate to term it as that because we're trying to take responsibility for our lives. And that's what, to me, the sovereignty thing is about. As a matter of fact, I don't even like to use the term sovereignty as applies to me necessarily because we would all agree and say that there's one sovereign and that we are sovereigns or kings and priests within that sovereignty. So it's by authority, by rule. Even in the world, there's kings that are under other kings, right? Sovereigns can operate under another sovereign. That's been going on for for millennium. The king of France was under the king of England. Not a problem. Just pay me my money. That's all we want. <laughs> okay, before I get started into this, I have to make disclaimers before I do this, Bob, because I've had people's eyes roll back in their head. Okay. I want to make this one real clear. I'm not an agent of any entity structures that any of you guys have ever heard of. Okay, one meeting I went to, I was asked if I was in naval intelligence. And as I was heard down at the table, <laughs> the answer to that is I. <laughs> Anything I say here, too, I'll just say this up front. It's not intended to offend anybody. This is going to be just a brief kind of overview of stuff that we've learned over the years as it relates to how we even talk, think, and speak. One of the things I told Bob when he asked me to do this this morning, I had to sit down real quick and say, well, how would I do this? And so what I'm going to do is I'll lay out a, I'm going to lay out a little bit of a format between and tie three things together, admiralty jurisdiction, commerce, commercial terms, and religion. And they're all tied together. Anybody in here doesn't realize that the commerce and the religions and the admiralty are all tied together? The intent here, too, is that when I say it, it's not, I'm, it's not intended to, anything intended to offend, so please don't take it that way. If I say something that you may not be familiar with or may not have heard before, 
especially if it has anything to do with a religious term. But it is intended to spur thought, and I'm not an expert on any of this. As I told somebody on a conference call last Sunday, when they were interviewing me or asking me questions about why English has been the chosen language for commerce today, internationally, they said something, they had, somebody made a reference about an expert, and I said, there are no such thing on this planet. There is no such thing as an expert on this planet. Scripture tells us the truth is in no man. Anybody that thinks that they know everything, they got a real problem. Okay, the first one I'm going to write up here, because what we're talking about in talking about words is we're talking about diction. Now, today we call these things languages. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. I want to come up here with another term because Don lays this out. I think he did it last quarter or whatever in talking about jurisdictions and how the clouds, you know, there's a dur one jurisdiction over here and there's another jurisdiction over here and you create these clouds and to go over there and see the United States cloud, you have to stick your head in there to be able to see it because it does not exist in reality. Nevada is a construct. Florida is a construct. As I used to tell people, and I did this in a seminar last year, I've been flown all over this country and I haven't seen any lines in the dirt anywhere yet. And all these things that men do about drawing these lines in the dirt mostly is to do this. We've seen, we saw this one on Bugs Bunny, right? <laughs> I dare you to step across that line. And that's usually what it's about. And that's the way it ends up. That's why we have so much war in the world. One of the reasons. So I'm just going to do a quick analysis of this and break this down. The word jurisdiction, in its pure sense, is about communication. That's what the word diction means. The word juris comes from a word, we would scribe it this way. I'm going to use the word scribe or write. I don't like the word spell. Anybody know why? They teach you guys how to spell in school? Spelling? The word spelling means to cast a spell. That's what it is. In communication, you have symbols, you have letters, you have all sorts of things. And every level of what they do in the school systems, the Masons, the Illuminati, or whatever you want to call them, do everything is done for a reason. A woman was up here, and I think her name was Dana. It might not have been Dana. I don't remember which one she was. She got upset about the birth certificate. Who got upset about the birth certificate? She's already gone. A mention was made about this thing of being informant. Okay. Now, what is she informing on? What is the wife, not the mother, the wife, what is she informing on, on these birth certificates? Paternity. Paternity, yeah, that's part of it. Usually informant means to bring information about a crime or criminal activity or something done wrong. Okay, something done wrong. I'll accept that one. That's good. Absolutely. Why? I'm sorry. Okay, what she said was that she's informing on the birth of a bastard child. Because if you read the birth certificate and the way it's all laid out, the father is up here, the mother, I mean the maiden is down below, the, the mother, the mother of the child. They only want the maiden name. Now over here on this, in this place, they've changed these. They don't do this anymore. They have changed this a little bit. But the mother, or the wife, the, with the last name of the, of the father up here is the one that's informing that he had an, had an adulterous affair with a maiden. Everything they do in their system has a reason. Why a bastard child? So they, can take it. so they can take it because bastard children have no right of inheritance, right? Everything they do is for a reason. Of course, it's also why today that we're not raising living beings anymore. We're raising adults because that's short for adulterer. They're putting these things in the words you speak every single day. Adult language is on television. It is adult language, isn't it? Yes. Sure. Uh, when I explain to people about the birth certificate, I tell them that, that a bastard is automatically a ward of the court. Then when you get the marriage certificate, that makes them double. Um, the state has two reasons to take over that child because it's an offspring of something that they're part of, plus it's a bastard. That's correct on both counts. And what they do systematically through this is they build a series of, ad, uh, we, we call them adhesion contracts, or, contra or it doesn't matter whether they implied adhesion, it does not matter. They build all kinds of evidence. For a long time we used to talk about we have to rebut the presumptions. Then we came up last year with that, no, we don't want to rebut because that's an argument. We're just going to remove the presumptions. And then recently I came up with this and thinking about it going, there are no presumptions. 
they've got tons of contracts with your signatures all over them that verify exactly what they say in court. When they go in there, all this stuff, the judge goes, oh, you got an IRS problem? Oh, you got a constitutional argument. Let's see. Oh, but you got a bank account. Hmm. Now we got a contract. No constitution here, right? Okay. The word U.S. in its origin is an Aramaic word, and it means in a straight line. Now, the Hebrew Aramaic languages, those, all of those languages are more <clears throat> written as um, metaphors anyway. They paint pictures <clears throat> because the symbols are pictographic in nature, and the le English letters are too, by the way. It's just that that's been removed so that people don't know what they are. In a straight line really means to be correct, and more to the point, it means to be truthful. That's, it all really means in the courtroom or in jurisdiction, who's telling the truth? They know what they do, and they operate on ignorance. And, of course, everybody's familiar with the phrase out of Hosea, which says that ignorance of the law is no excuse, and they use it. I mean, it doesn't say that. It says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge or destroyed for ignorance. I always like to read verses, or there were no verses in the original. They just, they just wrote pages. That's all they wrote. And uh, so I like to read the whole thing. And one of the things that people don't like to accept in doing this, about accepting being sovereign, accepting responsibility, is that it's not just that you're destroyed for ignorance or destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Creator Himself says that when you do that, I will reject you. So when you're out here getting slaughtered by the corporation, is there any mystery to why that's happening? So it does take a lot of study. We've spent untold hours, untold hours. Uh, when we lived, um, my wife and I actually, when we got started with David Wynn Miller, we were living in St. Kitts at the time, and down there, unless you have cable, you don't get TV or radio. And that, that thing was gone for a whole year, and I was amazed at how much I got done in a year with no television and no radio on. It had never been that way in my life. I mean, I, I had been that way at times, but still those things were around. All right, I'm going to go into this then and tie this together with, oh, by the way, the reason I wrote this up here, and I'll show you in a, in a minute, this is an admiralty term. Language is an admiralty term. It comes from one of the games that they like to play in changing the dictions is to change the vowels around. And this word is langrage or language. And it's been spelled differently. And I'll use the word spelling in this case because this is another thing they do. I've seen it spelled any number of ways in different dictionaries. <clears throat> the reason I say it's an admiralty term is it's a substance that's shot out of a cannon when another, one ship is approaching another, and it's what it's designed to do is disable the sails of the ship, whether it's like a bolo that wraps around and disables it, and it'll just basically cut the sail off, and it'll fall over. But what it does is it leaves the ship dead in the water, which is exactly where they want us, is dead in the water. But I'm going to go into some admiralty terms real quick just to show you how they're, some of the things that we're doing here and how they're tied in with what we see every day. What propels commerce? No, what propels in, in business out there? You go to a store, what are they doing? Trade or, let's use this word. It's buying and selling, right? But this is the same word as this. It's an admiralty term. The, it, the same way that, that the sales of a ship propel, propel the ship, sales propel commerce. And then everybody wants to, everybody in the store at Walmart, they want to know what their net is. Right? <laughs> oh, here's a good one. We've been talking about driving today or people out on the, you're out there on the road. Here's a word for you. The patrol, right? Actually, they left the H out. It should be Faye. And they also left an A and a W out. Because that's what they're doing out there in Admiralty jurisdiction with those those cars, is they are tra they are trawling. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and another little thing that they do, I would get in, I'll have a little fun with this one. It's, this stuff when we, when we get on a roll with this, I love it because they also have this little device on the car. And what is it? What is it called? No, 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 no. Siren. Oh. Yeah. And what were the sirens? What did they do in Admiralty? They tricked, they tricked people, right? Caused you to pull over on too close to the shore and crash. <laughs> right? Siren? The sirens were those maidens that's, that were out there on the shores. 
is saying to the sailors that made these nice musical noises and things that would cause them to lose their mind and go, go steer into the, into the rocks and crash, which is what happens when you pull off on the right-hand side of the road, right? Okay, some other admiralty terms. If you, I'll, I'll recommend some websites, too, as I go through this. There's a great glossary on the Internet called Tetley's. It's Tetley's Glossary of Admiralty Maritime Terms. You can do a Google search. It'll pop right up. Tetley's Mar- uh, Maritime. Because one of the words that we don't realize that we see all the time or that we participate in, or so unfortunately I've had to do this one, too, is the word arrest. An arrest is a pure admiralty term. It's what they do to a boat when they want to seize it. This was one of the first things. Tetley's helped me start understanding a little bit about jurisdictions and the, and the levels of jurisdictions because I couldn't wrap my head around well, admiralty, maritime, common law. What, why all these different things? <clears throat> and what it says about an arrest in Tetley's is that an arrest is something that's done in common law venues or common law jurisdictions by an admiralty court to seize a vessel as a surety beforehand. Until I read that, I didn't understand that the Admiralty Court could be in common law. I mean, I don't know why that escaped me, but it did for a long time. Of course, after the arrest, we have to bail our ship out because we just got sunk. Okay, I'm going to shift gears for a minute. I'll get back to Admiralty terms because these are going to tie in. The other line of thought I had in doing this, one day I was sitting down and I was really thinking about what goes on in the courtroom. The first thing they have you do, they call you up there and they want you to swear an oath. Now, part of this too pertains, I'm going to get into phonetics a little bit, because I started realizing there was a lot of words in the English language that came out of the Hebrew in the studies that I was doing. And the word oath was one of them. For whatever revelation that came to me that day was where I started the study. Okay, so the word oath, I'll take, go through how this applies real quick. The oath came from O-T-H, or the way it's pronounced in Hebrew is oat. There's four very significant places that this is used in Scripture. The first one is in Genesis 1, where it says that the sun, moon, and stars were put in the heavens as an oat to mark out the days, the years, and the appointed times. And it's not seasons, it's appointed times. That's what in Hebrew they called the moed, the appointments. Okay, rightly we would say that this word in the Hebrew is a sign. These things were put out as signs. Actually, they don't look at it as signs, they just call it an oath. This all over the Old Testament, I'll tell you this right now. But in for, the significant places I found it was in relation to the, the Pesach, what today is called the Passover. This was an oat in your hand and in your forehead. Now, also going back to metaphor, in the hand and in the forehead didn't mean that, this, that somebody came, that when you were celebrating Passover, that one day they were going to make sure everybody got their hand stamped, right? It's not what it had to do with. In the Hebrew, it meant with your right hand, you were doing something. You were doing it. You were celebrating this feast. You were keeping it. You were doing it in accordance with what was proclaimed that they should do. In the forehead does not mean a stamp in the forehead, the, the Hebrew metaphor there is in between the eyes or in between the temples. What it meant is not only were you doing it, but you were thinking and dwelling on it or meditating on it. The other place had to do with the Sabbath being an eternal oath. And the other place that was very significant in all of this admiralty jurisdiction stuff is that the 12 tribes were required to bring their oath, which was what? What do these guys over here have? What do the ships have? They had to bring their banners or their flag to the tent of the meeting. Now, when I looked at this and researched it, and I went into a regular dictionary, which is this one right here. I'll show this real quick. Because this dictionary has become special to me. I don't know why I fell upon this one. It's a copy of 1977 Merriam-Webster's. What I know from one of my friends that I study with in this, he knows more about the symbols, and I listen to more of the phonetics. And when he and I get together, it's, it's a real it's a good time. There are certain symbols in these books. He could probably show them to me. I've never asked, but he tells me that for the Masons, there are symbols in here that tell them which dictionaries to buy. Okay, because there's things, there's more things written in some than others. And this one turned out to be a wealth of information because the most important thing in the dictionary is the part they put in the brackets. <laughs> the part that we say is removed. Now, what's in the brackets is the etymology, the Old English the old high German, 
and where these things came from and what they originally meant. Because you know, one of the things that people like to get into today is this thing they call evolutionary thinking. Everything's evolving. Didn't you guys know everything's evolving? Sure. Your language is evolving. The reality of it is the tongue and the dictions were supposed to be consistent so that the, that the wealth of information from ages and ages and ages was preserved and passed down.